40 was. That was the year before I was born. He's talking about that thing's 45 years old. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I give, I, I, give, uh, I give Dad a hard time quite a bit, but um, uh, I tell you, I wouldn't change him here with me for nothing. Uh, I hope maybe that uh, we can appreciate the blessing we have with someone who's not a song leader but a music minister, someone who's called into the ministry of music, and to see his passion for things like this, that's a blessing to me. And I know he's my dad, and I'm a little partial, but uh, I'm, I'm so glad to, to, to hear that in his voice, and that's pretty good stuff right there. And, uh, I'm, I'm proud of my dad. There's a lot of stuff I don't know about. He don't tell me this stuff. I find out later. Amen. But uh, yeah, it was good, really good. So good job there. That, that was beautiful. I'd like to get that uh, get that saved. That, that's wonderful. It's good to be here tonight. Amen. Had a good um, uh, good service this morning. Great spirit. Just felt wonderful to be here. And our Bible study was good. We had some good discussion. Uh, for those of you who didn't get to make it, we're going to embark on a journey through the book of Daniel, start with our next Bible study. We're going to go uh, still do questions if you've got them at the first, but then we're going to go through Daniel and, and uh, just learn more. It's a tremendous book. It ties in very well with uh, Revelation, which we covered previously. So I think that'll be a great thing. Uh, Brother Lloyd. Is, and, and Tanya are back with us tonight, and it, it's good to see them. If you've talked to Brother Lloyd, he sounds like he's old. <laughs> it's, uh, this illness has got the, got the bedroom in the last little while, and his voice is still almost gone. But he asked me to share this. <laughs> he asked me to share this. He, he couldn't because of his voice, but um, his brother-in-law that we had been praying for um, with his uh, feet issues, he was looking at having two toes amputated and gangrene had set in. They were beginning to smell a pretty bad situation. Um, but uh, uh, he can fill in on the details, but God moved. And, and uh, God began to turn and bring back color, bring back feeling and things. And he was sent to another doctor and the specialist looked at it and said, nothing wrong with him. And he had no toes removed. He went from two toes being uh, taken to none. And that's nothing short of just the hand of God moving. So we're glad the Lord shared that. That's a tremendous story. There's more details to it, but I'm glad to that. Amen. You got your Bibles tonight. Go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms is, as we may know, the largest book in the Bible. Also one of the greatest. It has songs and prayers different things written that are tremendous uh, helps. It, it really shows us a picture of the heart of David, which we know was a man uh, after God's heart. God really enjoyed fellowship with David. Um, there is a psalm of David in 139, Psalms 139. It's a beautiful one. I don't want to cover the whole thing for time's sake, but we will look at the last two verses, Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 and 24 23 and 24 I want to preach to you tonight on cultivating the Christian heart how long has it been since we asked God to take a look on the inside of you and I it's one thing and most of the time we preach about asking Christ into our hearts and giving our lives to him and that's tremendous that's important that's, that's priority it's what's got to be done needs to be done but after we've been saved, how often do we find ourselves asking God to take a look on the inside? Lord, look in here and show me what I can't see. Show me what needs to be brought to the light. Because in the New Testament, it tells us that we love the darkness and we tend to kind of go towards that darkness and we'll hide evil deeds and evil thoughts and stuff in the dark recesses of our hearts. But God needs to bring those to light. And it's a scary thing to want to let God see that. So... David deals with that. Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. If you've got it, say amen. amen. The Bible says very beautifully, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we sure do thank you. It's just such a blessing to be with my friends again, to be together as we sing, as we fellowship, as we pray, and 
enjoy each other's company and we enjoy now standing before your word. And we pray, God, as this word tonight may be challenging for us, but that we'll hear it, be obedient to it, and let you do what you need to do with us, for us, and to us, that we might be more like your son. Now, Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray you'll bless the reading of your word. Lead us closer to Christ tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for standing with me. Anybody remember plowing ground with the, uh, the old mule and the Lost the term. Plow. Another term for that attaches behind, you know, that digs up the ground. Well, uh, I, I never had the opportunity to do that, but I've read stories and, uh, of people who would go and, and get a new place of ground, and they were trying to cultivate that ground to make it where plants or crops could be planted on it. And what they would do is they would take the plow, and they would go make an initial run over the top of the ground and the soil. And what typically would happen is on that first pass, it would bring up a lot of the big boulders, a lot of the bigger rocks, a lot of the things that are just under the surface. And of course, you have to clear all that out. You know, some of you may have had that wonderful chore of uh, picking rocks out the garden and, and cleaning out ground to plant things on. Well, after that was done, there, you know, you had to make another pass and go a little deeper and get a little further into it to turn the soil over. Well, of course, that brings more rocks and more roots and things like that up to the surface. And, those have got to be cleaned out, and then another pass is made. And it's the same thing, and the deeper that the plow gets, the smaller the roots and rocks become until you get ground that can be used for planting good, if you will, cultivated and fertile soil. Tonight, it's my hope that we can cultivate the Christian heart, that we might allow God, if you will, to run his plow through our hearts, to allow God to run through the ground of our heart and show us turn up some things if we can that maybe we've not thought about, we've not addressed, some things maybe we need to let God involve himself with or whatever it may be. David makes this prayer, and I think it's a tremendous prayer. Uh, very often we get focused on getting saved. And, and again, that's priority. That's the most important of, of, of things. We must be saved. But once we are saved, do we allow God to continue the process of cultivating us? We talk about growing. You know, the Bible talks about growing in Christ. If we're going to grow, right, we've got to have ground where something can grow. Jesus talked about the, the seeds that fell on the rocky soil, the seed that fell on this type of ground, that type of ground. Some fell among thorns and got choked out and all this other stuff. But some of it fell on good ground. And we read that and we think, well, I want to be good ground. Well, how can we be? We must be cultivated. We must have the ground, if you will, broken up, get down into the deeper parts of us, find those things that are stopping growth, and get them out of the way. Now, here's the, that's the hard part, letting God do that, because I'll tell you, it's not a real comfortable thing. Because when you begin to see what's on the inside of you, you're probably not going to like it very well. It may bring some uncomfortable feelings. It may bring some things that confront you. But I'll tell you, if we'll do that, and we'll let God do what God will do, it will help us. And we will grow as Christians, and we will grow in, in, in the knowledge of the Word, and we'll find that that is what we've needed all along. David prays this way. David was a man for a good part of his life who loved God, served God in tremendous ways, a man that you wouldn't think had anything hid from God. You know, he and God were an open book, but even David knew. I've got to let God in, not just believing, not just walking with him. I've got to let God in to continue to work in me and through me. Now, let's take a look at this. What's God looking for in this um, uncultivated, if you will, ground? What is he trying to bring up? What type of rocks are there in us? What kind of roots are there in us? What type of imperfections are there in us that God is trying to bring to the surface? First of all, uh, look at verse 23. I want you to see this. Verse 23 begins, Search me, O God. Now that word means to literally penetrate the heart. What David is saying is, Get down in there, Lord. Get down in there. Have you ever asked God to get down into your heart? Not in the saving fashion. We should be, hopefully tonight, everybody here is saved. If you're not, we can fix that before you leave. Amen? Hopefully everybody here is saved. But have you ever told God... Lord, thank you for saving me, but dig down in there. Get into my heart. Show me me. Show me you, and show me how to be more like you, right? 
and less like me. David said, search me, O God, penetrate down into my heart. And then he says this, know my heart. I want to tell you this first of all tonight. He is not looking for unforgiven sin. I'm talking to Christians tonight. He is not looking for unforgiven sin. Why? Because if you have put your faith and trust in Christ, they've been forgiven. They've been forgiven. Now there's more to it. But he's not trying to dig out things that you've not apologized for. I meet people all the time who are getting to the end of their life. And they're saying, I've just been thinking all day about things I maybe hadn't asked God to forgive me for. And they've racked their brain and they've stressed themselves out. And I try to gently as I tell them, are you not trusting Christ? Have you trusted Christ? Because the Bible says he took them all. He took them all on him. Now there are things that I've done, no doubt through my past, that I don't remember that I've done. Some thoughts, some Oh, sins of omission, sins of commission, or otherwise that I've done that have slipped my mind. We ought to be, as Christians, very upfront with God and say, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. But there are things in there that probably we've missed. And this, this whole purpose of this is not for us to go digging around and, and stressing out and trying to figure out what is it we've not told God sorry for. We should tell God sorry for anything and everything that comes up. But that's not necessarily what he's looking for. That's what Jesus has done. The price has been paid. The forgiveness has been there. That's why David says, know my heart. The only way to have all of your sins forgiven is to come under the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, they had a sacrificial system. In the Old Testament, they would buy animals, sacrifice them at the temple. And they had to go through rituals. They had to go through ceremony. And if anything wasn't done correctly, the forgiveness wasn't applied. And there was a chance, even with the sacrifice, that God wouldn't accept it. How would that be? That would be a miserable life. But the death of Christ was the atoning for the sins of man. Now, know my heart, David said. For the Christian, it's God, look at my heart. If I'm saved, we're not looking for God to bring out things we've not yet asked forgiveness for. But that's not the end of it. Now look on a little further. He says, search me, O God, know my heart. And then he says, try me and know my thoughts. What he is looking for, I believe this is telling us, is unrepented of sin. Not unforgiven sin because that's on Christ, unrepented of sin. Now what is that? It's sins that we have not dealt with. It's sins that we see, sins that we know, but things we've not yet changed about ourselves. Okay, David says try me. That word try means to, to, to uh, test or to examine. Examine me and know my thoughts. Are there things in us as God begins to dig that we've not repented of? Now once you're Christian, the Bible says we are to repent, right? Repent and, and turn. What repenting, somebody said, is turning 360 degrees. Well, if you ever went to math class, that's not going to get you very far. <laughs> 360 gets you right back where you started, you know. 180 is what you're looking for. That's a complete turn to the opposite way. That's what repenting is. And once we are saved, that is then the thing God is trying to cultivate in us is repentance. Showing us things that we need to change. Have you ever asked God to show you what needs to change about you? I'll tell you something, you're not going to like it. <laughs> because we fall in love with ourselves. Anybody here in love with yourself? Don't point at your husband. Don't do that. Don't point at you, I. <laughs> but we fall in love with ourselves and we begin to think that uh, I'm fine just like I am. There ain't nothing wrong with me. Uh, God loves me for who I am. <laughs> and he does. But I'll tell you, we take that sometimes we run places we ought not run with it. The Bible says repentance is something that has to take place daily all the time. An uh, attitude of repentance. That's where revival is going to start. If we have it at all, is when Christians repent and change. God's not trying to show you unforgiven sins if you're a Christian. He's trying to show you things you need to change. David said, try me, God. Give me a test. When you go to school, the teacher gives you a test. Why does she give you a test? To make you miserable? That's what we used to think. But as we get older, we come to find out they give you that test to see if you learned anything. To see if you have uh, taken and adapted what you've been taught. David said, test me. Try me, God. Know my thoughts. Is there things in me that need to change? Is there anything in you that needs to change? That's a very tough question. And the quick answer for most people is like, no, I'm doing pretty good. But I'll tell you, have you let God dig? Now, salvation is the topsoil, okay? Salvation is the top pull of the plow. 
pulls out those gigantic stones of sin that you can't abend for, of things that you can't get forgiveness on your own, of things that only Christ can do. That's the top layer. Once that's been removed, is it good for planting? Is it good for growth? Not necessarily. We've got to let God go deeper. Don't we sing that song? Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus. What's that mean? Let him go deeper so that we might go deeper with him. Let him get down and plow deeper beyond that and find the things that need to change about me and you. Preacher, is there anything that needs to change about you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm happy to report to you tonight that over the years, some of them, uh, I have very easily heeded to God and some, some, some things I could change that were easy. And okay, God, I got that. I, I see that now in myself. And I see that that's not whether pleasing or honoring or, or good. So I'll change that. But I'll tell you, there's some other things that God shows you and we just kind of look away. You ever done that? God will touch our hearts with something. And uh, we don't really like it. And we kind of tend to think to ourselves, well, I'm too old to do anything different. Or, or uh, you know, we take grace and we kind of mend it into it and say, well, this is God. God loves me like I am. Yes, he does. But he's not okay with us not growing. He's not okay with us staying in that same shape the rest of our lives. He did not save you just to have the top ground plowed up. He saved you so that he might cultivate you, get down on the inside of you, bring things up that he might address and help you be more like Jesus. Now, we're never going to be exactly like him, but that should be the goal of every Christian. Let me be more like my Savior. And if you want to be like Jesus, let me tell you something. You better let God in here and start to dig in. Because if you don't, you're never going to make it. And you're going to find something. You're going to find if you don't let God get in here and dig, you're never going to change. We as Christians should always be changing. We should always be growing. We should always be learning. We should be adapting. Things about us should change. There are things about my personality that have changed. There are things about the way I approach life that have changed. My decision-making processes have changed. Why is that? Because I'm older? Smarter? No, it's because God is cultivating me and showing me and teaching me. Do I like it all the time? No. But if it's God's way, it's the right way. Now, in order for that to happen, I've got to fight the flesh. Is that hard? When somebody, uh, if you've got trouble with anger and somebody does something to you, it's hard to fight that flesh, isn't it? It's hard to fight that flesh. But when God's trying to dig in here and cultivate you and grow you, He's trying to teach you patience. He's trying to teach you on suffering. He's trying to teach you understanding. Many things he tries to teach you, but you've got to fight that. If not, you're just on the top. God's not got deep enough. But I'll tell you, the more we let God dig, the stronger, the better it will be. Try me and know my thoughts. Unrepented of sin. When should we repent? Every single day. And I'll take it further than that. Multiple times a day. Anytime that the Spirit of God makes you aware of a mistake, repent. Amen. You ain't got to go pleading to God to save your soul again. Grace has covered that. Unforgiveness is not the goal. Repentance is the goal. When God reveals a sin, when God reveals a fault, when God reveals a mistake that we've done, we come to Him and say, Lord God, I'm sorry. Now let me tell you something. My kids have my unconditional love. Do you parents understand that? Your, your, your children have your unconditional love. But that still don't mean they're not supposed to tell me they're sorry. Amen? I love my wife unconditionally. She's wrong all the time. <laughs> if she'd tell me she's sorry more, we'd get along better. <laughs> I could do that because not a soul in this church believes what I just said. Amen? <laughs> We love each other, but if I do something that wrongs her or she does something that wrongs me, I'll tell you what will fix it real quick, fast, and in a hurry is a genuine apology. Now, is she going to love me whether or not I apologize? Look at me. Of course she's going to love me. <laughs> Am I going to love her if she doesn't apologize? Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to love my children when they make me mad. And they don't. I'll never forget this. Bryce was young. I'm still mad thinking about it. He did something. I don't remember what the boy did. But I told him, I said, son, go apologize what you did. And that knothead would not do it. I mean, would not. 
he bucked and no, he didn't say much, he just refused to do it. And that lit me up, boy. I mean, did not like that. And uh, <laughs> I loved him, but I wanted to hear the apology. That's what God wants from us. That's what this is all about. It's not for us pleading for our souls and escape from hell every moment of every day. Christ has settled that. What it is is you and I come before God and say, Lord, I love you, and I didn't mean to do what I just did. Or maybe you're like me sometimes, and you did it knowing that it was wrong, but you did it anyway. You just had a flesh moment. But you come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Help me to change. Help me to not do that again. What is that? It is repentance. It's telling God, I don't want to do that again. I want to do the opposite of it. That's what God wants. That's the purpose of Him digging down into us. Is to bring up these things that we need to change about ourselves. And if you don't think there's anything that needs to change about you, let God do some digging. Now, I'm not saying He's going to change everything about you. But we've all got things that need a little work. Amen? The little kid psalm says, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Now, let's look at verse 24. He's not looking for unforgiven sins. He is looking for unrepented of sins, and he also is looking for unconfessed sin. I've already talked about this, but I want you to see this verse 24. And see, David said, if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. There are things, I believe, that if we'll let God look at, we need to make right. Things we've done. Things we've allowed to happen. Things we've been a part of. There are things in there that we have not come to God and said, Lord, I'm sorry. And I need to make that right. You know, if you read and study about revivals, there have been so many revivals that have started simply with a church service that turned into people apologizing to each other. It's amazing how God what is that? It's confessing wrongdoing. It's amazing how we as Christians are willing to tell God we're sinners and save us, but when it comes to admitting we've done something wrong, we just refuse to do it. Anybody know anybody that's never wrong like Brandy? Get her, boy. I know people like, I know people, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, but I know people who will never admit they're wrong. It doesn't matter what has happened. They are never wrong. Now, I'll tell you something. That's a product of the flesh. That's a product of pride. And that stinks in the nostrils of God. Now, I'm not saying to be a martyr and fall on the sword and take the blame for everything that goes wrong in the world. I've done that. That doesn't work. Okay? But I'm talking about things when we are wrong, willing to confess that we're wrong. Too many times, if we're not careful, it'll turn into the other person's fault. You ever prayed that way? Lord, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but so-and-so shouldn't have done that. Lord, I'm sorry I did what I did. Lord, I shouldn't have said what I said, but Lord, do something with them. Have you ever prayed for God to fix somebody else? I have. I'll be honest with you, I've done it. God, I don't like the way I'm thinking about this person. I don't like what I said. I don't like what I did. I'm sorry, but this is why I did it. Do something with them, Lord. <laughs> you know what that is? Unconfessed sin. That's a heart that rises up in pride and says, it ain't me, it's them. Friend, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what somebody else does to you. If you are wrong, you are wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It doesn't matter what caused it. If you let it happen, whether it was intentional or unintentional, whatever happened, if you're wrong, you're wrong. And you need to get with God and tell Him that and not wait on the other person. I tell, there's, there's people who are still holding grudges and, and anger against people and they're waiting on them to apologize. That's going to kill you. That's going to kill you spiritually. What you've got to do is get before God and ask God to forgive you for not forgiving them. But that turns into the devil saying, well, they're, not, you know, they're the wrong one. They should apologize, and if they'll apologize, then I'll tell God I'm sorry for not forgiving them. That's wrong. I saw a lady one time look me right in the eye with a look that scared me, to be honest with you. A lady that her testimony was that of a Christian. She looked me in the eye, and she told me something about a sister of hers, a biological sister. And, you know, I'm not going to get into all of it, but it was, you know, it, 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 was, 
It was rough. And she looked me in the eye. She said, I'll never forgive her. And, you know, I knew this lady. So I tried to come back, you know, as gentle as I could and try to, you know, you got to find that forgiveness, you know, whether or not she ever realizes it or she ever asks for forgiveness. You've got to, and, I, and she cut me off with it. I mean, ugh. and looked me right now and said, I will never, ever forgive her. And God shut it down right there. God said, leave it alone. And I'll never forget that. What is that? That is the picture of unconfessed sin. She let what somebody else did break her fellowship with God. You. Now, if you let that happen, it's going to eat you alive. You. And the problem is, you've done it to yourself. I've done it to myself. If my relationship is with God is based on how other people act, I'm not going to have one. If my relationship with God is based on how nice people are to me, I'm not going to have one. If those things arise in your heart, you have got to come to God and say, Lord, this is in my heart, and I don't want it there. Jesus said, if you ain't going to forgive your brother, I expect God to forgive you. What's that mean? God expects us to confess our sins. If it's unforgiveness, give that to God. If that other person does or doesn't ever do what they're supposed to do, you give that to God. If there are things that he shows you as he is cultivating, things you have not talked to God about, does anybody have those? Anybody ever done something and you just didn't want to talk to God about it? It's kind of like getting in trouble and you didn't want mom and dad to find out. My brother used to get in trouble at school all the time. He'd take the notes the teacher would send home and he'd throw them away. That worked for a little while. You don't remember that. <laughs> but some precious guardian angel would find the notes and unravel them and hand them to mama. <laughs> Be sure your sins will find you out. But it's the same idea. Hiding things from God. Not addressing things with God. Letting things creep into us and not being aware of them. Uh, let Things coming about. Things happening and us not talking to God about it. Uh, us not asking God, is this a good thing? Uh, Lord, I'm starting this or I'm, I'm going to do this. Is this good or bad for me? Lord, I, I did this or I, I started doing this. And some people do all kind of wild stuff and they're wrong. And... Uh, God maybe tries to burden their heart. If they're saved, he will. The Holy Spirit will. But they're not going to confess that it's wrong. Unconfessed sin will destroy your relationship with God. I get it. I get it. There are things that we do in weakness of the flesh, in moments we do things. And we're ashamed of them. We're embarrassed by them. They hurt and we don't want to talk about them. Things that we deal with, we don't want to talk about them. But my friend, you must talk to God about them. Especially if it is sin. If it is sin, you must talk to God about it. David is a tremendous example. When he sinned with Bathsheba, instead of going to God and working things out with God, he did it his way. Bring me your eye. Had him killed. You see, doing things your way will never work. When God wants to get into your heart and He wants to plow into you, He is not trying to hurt you. He's trying to help you. Once we get into a habit of confessing sin before God and saying, God, I was wrong. No matter what somebody else did, doesn't matter what caused me to do it, Lord, I was wrong. And Lord, I'm sorry for that. Help me to change. Unconfessed sin turns into confessed sin. Unrepented of sin turns into repented of sin. And that pleases the heart of God. And God then can begin to grow and work in us. Have you ever asked God to forgive you of something over and over and over and over and over? It just might be that you're not letting God dig. It just might be that God needs to get a little deeper. And we're not letting. Now, as I said, we need to repent every day. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He had struggled with his whole life. There are those things out there. But I'm saying if we continue to struggle down this road and we're not growing, we don't feel like we're growing, we don't feel like things are getting any better, are we letting God dig in deeper? So I want to leave you with that challenge tonight. Let God search you. Let God penetrate your heart. Let God break not only the topsoil, let God dig. Let Him dig. 
and what is brought to the surface, deal with it. If you've never talked to God about it, talk to God about it. If you've never repented of it, repent of it. If something needs to happen, do it. If God brings up somebody you stole from or didn't or cheated years ago, try to make that right. If God brings up someone that you hurt, maybe it's been a long time ago, try to make that right if you can, humanly possible. When God shows it to you, He doesn't show it to you just for your fun. He shows it to you that you might do something about it. And if you'll do something about it, you will grow and you will get stronger and you will find the battles against evil. You will come out on the top easier and more often because you've learned how to walk with God and let Him grow in you. Oh, let God dig. Let Him dig. Well, preacher, I'm afraid of what He might find. Don't be. Because if you're afraid, you won't, you won't let Him. Say, God, go. Go as far, go as deep. Lord, search my heart. And when you're praying, say, God, search my heart. Show me. Bring to remembrance things maybe that I need to deal with. Show me things about me that I need to change. Show me things I need to make right. Show me things I've not repented of that I need to. All that stuff. And man, you'll start to grow. You'll start to grow. We all need that, don't we? Then we'll see revival. Let's stand together all around the church tonight. As we stand, if we're able to stand.